Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Well, happy Pride Month, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Sarah Pinkham, and I'm the Exhibition and Engagement Coordinator for the Main Library Gallery at the University of Iowa Libraries. Um, because today's event comes to you today from Iowa City, I would like to take a moment to show gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk Nations and all other Indigenous peoples who have inhabited this place. Thank you. And for those who haven't yet had a chance to visit, the main library gallery is located on the first floor of the main library, and we produce a new exhibit each semester in which guest curators use storytelling uh, and our archives and materials here at the UI libraries to share an area of their expertise with the community. So this presentation today is part of programming for the Out and About Queer Life in Iowa City exhibit, which was curated by Maddie Hoberg with Aidan Bettin. And this exhibit is in the main library gallery until June 30th, so all the way through Pride Month, and is also available online through the gallery website if you're not able to come to our location. Many items in this exhibit come from collections in the Iowa Women's Archives here at the UI Libraries, and today's talk with Anna Holland focuses on some of the collections that represent queer joy. Anna, whose pronouns are she, her, is the associate curator of the Iowa Women's Archives, where she's held various positions since 2015. She graduated with a BA in history from Augustana College in 2013 and from the University of Iowa with a master's in library and information science in 2018. She also received a certificate in book studies from the UI Center for the Book for the same year. Anna has had a long-standing interest in women's archives and queer history, and previously she chaired the women's collection section of the Society of American Archivists uh, and has given talks on Iowa's lesbian history at the Society of American Archivists, the University of Iowa, Cedar Rapids Public Library, and the Intergenerational Lesbian Conference here in Iowa City. So Anna will have some time for questions after her talk using the Q&A feature. The chat is disabled. Um, and so welcome, Anna, and thank you all for being here today. I will turn it over to Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Anna Holland, the Associate Curator of the Iowa Women's Archives, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Queer Life, Queer Joy, and the Archival Value of Happiness, this beautiful first day of Pride Month. The Iowa City produced journal, Common Lives, Lesbian Lives, had a practice, which some of you may be familiar with from other contexts, and some of you may have seen in the current exhibit, Out and About, Queer Life in Iowa City. Each article, artwork, or poem included a brief biographical statement about the author's identity that helped readers understand the context of the piece. The editors of Common Lives, Lesbian Lives did this in part to resist assuming things about a person's identity, for instance, their race or sexual orientation, until told otherwise. In homage to them and as a courtesy to you, I'll start the same way. I am a 33-year-old cis, straight, white woman who lives with her husband and son in Iowa City, Iowa. For the past eight years, I've held positions at the Iowa Women's Archives, which preserves the history of Iowa women. I have been the associate curator since 2022. Although my identities exclude me from some of the experiences and feelings shared by the queer people featured in Out and About, I have developed a real admiration for them over my years in the archives and have given previous talks on lesbian history in the state. You could say that although I am not queer, I am a big fan. Um, it was an honor to help curators Maddie Hoberg and Aidan Bettine use the Iowa Women's Archives materials for this exhibit and serve as an editor for the final captions. The UI Library's main gallery exhibit for the first half of 2023, Out and About Queer Life in Iowa City, features documents, images, artifacts, and ephemera that recount stories from the recent past about queer student groups, local businesses and organizations, and publications. These materials come from three local repositories, the University of Iowa's University Archives, the Iowa Women's Archives, and the LGBTQ Iowa Archives and Library, or LIL, which is located in Public Space One here in Iowa City. 
I want to take a few moments here to appreciate that we have three archival repositories collecting this history. <sighs> that would not have always been the case. Why? Well, for a long time, it wasn't thought to have archival value. When I tell people I'm an archivist, the number one response I get is, what is that? Or if they do know what it is, their understanding comes with some assumptions like, it's really dusty in there. It's not. Or I wear Mickey Mouse gloves all day. I don't. Or everything ends up in there. Some people will call me at the Iowa Women's Archives and expect that they can name a woman from Iowa and I'll just look her up. But actually only a sliver of what we as a society produce is preserved in an archives. That sliver is made up of what people choose to save or can save, what archivists choose to maintain and how they describe it. The idea of archival value is what guides archivists part of that equation. Archival value, according to the Society of American Archivists, is the ongoing usefulness of significance of records based on the administrative, legal, fiscal, evidential, or historical information they contain, justifying their continued preservation. But isn't that some, some of that kind of subjective? Well, yes. And that brings me to another assumption about archives that they are neutral vessels of history, full of simple facts waiting for interpretation. This is not and has never been the case. Early archives all the way back to ancient Greece were set up to preserve the records of those in power. The decrees of politicians, laws, business transactions. This made sure that those in power, usually meaning landed men, made it into the historical record and women, common people, minorities did not. This continued to be the case centuries later as the United States set up its first public archives in the early 20th century. The first two state archives were established in Alabama and Mississippi in 1901 and 1902 respectively. The early history of the Mississippi State Archives, as told by archivist Randall Jimerson in Archives Power, Memory, Accountability, and Social Justice, was a shameful example of how one archivist can influence what makes it into the archives. Mississippi's first state archivist, Dunbar Rowland, proudly elevated Confederate history and white supremacists well above other collecting priorities, despite recommendations from the state's historical commission that the archives should cover all aspects of Mississippi's history, including its black population. As a result, countless possible collections covering Mississippi's early history were lost, having never been preserved in the first place. In the same tragic vein, our country's queer history has passed much of it without ever having been collected. However, in the past 50 years, there has been an exponentially growing movement among archivists to first acknowledge that their profession is not neutral, that they must make decisions that have a bearing on what is saved and accessible to historians, and to course correct by collecting histories of people whose lives may originally have been lost to time. In 1970, Howard Zinn, who you may know as the author of A People's History of the United States, spoke at the annual meeting of the Society of American Archivists and issued a call to the profession to abandon the pretense of neutrality and to collect the history of the common people. In a follow-up article for the Midwest Archives Conference, he detailed examples of archivists of lavishing attention on rich men, white men, military men, while ignoring, quote, the poor, the obscure, the radicals, the outcasts, movements and living events, end quotes, such as the civil rights movement. He then charged archivists with compiling a whole new world of documentary material, the lives, desires, needs of ordinary people. Although Zinn didn't make an immediate large impact, archivists, librarians, and other informational professionals continued to talk about it. 
By 1983's Society of American Archivists meeting, historian and Minnesota State Senator Alan Speer told archivists that, quote, the concepts of neutrality and objectivity are impossible to achieve, and more often than not, smoke screens to hide what are really political decisions in support of the status quo, end quote. The argument against neutrality and for collecting resources about marginalized people came against a backdrop of the rise of Black history, women's history, and as in popularized, the people's history. Archivists supported these developments by expanding on the way they determined archival value to include collecting papers that provide a fuller picture of society. Repositories like the Iowa Women's Archives and the LGBTQ Iowa Archives and Library grew directly out of this way of thinking, becoming what is called activist archives. Collecting the papers and records of people who were traditionally underrepresented and trying to prevent gaps in the historical record from persisting is built into our core. This belief in the non-neutral archive and the conviction that archivists should interrogate their biases towards the powerful has resulted in, for instance, a university archives that collects not just the records of offices and officials, but of student groups like the Gay Liberation Front. The value of queer stories like this is archival value. Come on. In Out and About, there are plenty of examples of pride events. Today, parades, street festivals, like we have in Iowa City, are some of the most widely visible and joyful events in the LGBTQ community. The University of Iowa was an early adopter of pride. The Gay Liberation Front on UI's campus became the first gay student group to be recognized by a U.S. university in 1970. A campus and community-affiliated lesbian alliance followed in 1973. The Gay Liberation Front was part of an international Gay Liberation Front movement that formed in response to the 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York City. Their mission could perhaps be summed up by the poster in this U Iowa homecoming parade picture. Out of the closet, into the streets. The Gay Liberation Front members were done hiding. They wanted to be out and proud and accepted by society. In 1973, the Gay Liberation Front in Iowa City planned a gay pride dance to commemorate the fourth anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. A few advertisements appeared in local papers promising dancing, draft beer, and music at the local Unitarian Church. And coverage suggested that people from across Iowa and even out of state would attend the event. Joe Rabinald, a local documentarian of gay and lesbian life in Iowa City, saved newspaper clippings about the dance and the fallout. The night of the dance, nearly 100 people packed the hall of the Unitarian Church. There was dancing, beer, and music as promised. And then three state liquor agents with a backup force of highway patrol troopers, city police, and county sheriff's deputies raided the dance, confiscated two kegs of beer and about $12. And they charged two men, Guard Roper and Lauren Rodewald, with bootlegging and sale of beer without a permit. It was an enraging echo of the police raid that inspired the Stonewall riots the event was meant to commemorate. Thanks to Joe Rabinald, who initially sensed the archival value of this queer story and continued and the continued preservation efforts of the Iowa Women's Archives, who sought out the papers, we can see the continuation of the story. The Gay Liberation Front was not at all cowed. Their spokesperson, Glenn Kellogg, wasted no time in talking to journalists and accusing law enforcement of harassment. That story stuck. Three days after the May 5th dance, an editorial appeared in the campus newspaper, The Daily Iowan, alleging hypocrisy and persecution of the Gay Liberation Front. Why was beer served in exchange for donations at political party events in town without a raid? But the Gay Liberation Front could not do the same. The author said, quote, 
it is hard to believe that the anonymous tip came from an outraged citizen who considered a kegger to be a criminal offense. It is not hard to believe, however, that Mr. Anonymous did not care for the sexual preferences of the people attending the party or the religious preferences of the Unitarians, or both, end quote. Articles followed the next day in the Iowa City Press Citizen and the Des Moines Register, both questioning the equal application of the law in this instance. The Gay Liberation Front kept the story in the news all summer. They formed a defense fund for the arrested men through student legal services and threatened lawsuits against Iowa City and Johnson County. Even local politicians got involved. State Representative Arthur Small asked the State Commissioner of Public Safety to explain the apparent double standard involved in the raid. After months of concerted activism, all the charges for both men were finally dropped on August 30, 1973. Guard Roper was quoted as saying, the courts have protected me against harassment. This victory shows that no minority need accept unequal application of the laws, at least in Iowa. The next year, Gay Liberation Front was back in the paper, unbowed, advertising another dance, and the Unitarian Church continued to host women's only dances for the Lesbian Alliance well into the future. Here's a couple of examples of dance flyers. They say they are for women only rather than exclusively for lesbians, but the implication of openness is there. See the pumpkins pins? I know you know, I'm one too. And the joking reference to odorless onions for close encounters, implying that the women in attendance could be getting quite close. This story and the newspaper clippings that contain it have archival value. It has ongoing significance based on evidential and historical information it contains, justifying its preservation. This story about the Gay Liberation Front in Iowa City tells us how far the Gay Liberation Front has spread, what kinds of activities it engaged in, and what attitudes and harassment brought it to life. It also has value in showing how much things have changed. We can read this and see a nascent human rights movement and extrapolate from this one instance how much work it took to make the national changes we see around us today. Now we see the results of the risks taken by the people who organized and attended the dance. Would the out and about exhibit exist in the same world that raided the 1973 gay pride dance? We can also draw parallels between the discrimination the Gay Liberation Front faced and the ongoing struggle of today's LGBTQ community. But there's something besides discrimination and struggle that they have in common too. Did you see it? I see it in the flyers and advertisements. It's queer joy. A thread of happiness runs through the queer stories collected in the archives. And that's what I'd like to turn your attention to next. Have you heard of queer joy? The phrase has been popping up online and in pop culture over the past few years. There's a multimedia queer joy project, a queer joy podcast, queer joy Instagram accounts, and thousands upon thousands of hashtag queer joy posts around social media. The phrase has been centered in publications as diverse as TV Guide and Parents Magazine. So what is it? Where did it come from? And does it too have archival value? Queer joy probably owes some of its lineage to the slightly older concept of black joy both are situated in the activism of the 2010s. Writer Cleaver Cruz founded the Black Joy Project in 2015, centered on the idea that choosing joy amid an oppressive society is a resistant, regenerative act. In an article for Vogue by Sh Shante Joseph entitled, What Black Joy Means and Why It's More Important Than Ever, Cruz says, quote, Amplifying Black joy is not about dismissing or creating an alternative Black narrative that ignores the realities of our collective pain. Rather, it is about holding the pain and injustices we experience as Black folks around the world in tension with the joy we experience in pain's midst. It's not 
or it's, it is about using that joy as an entry into understanding the oppressive forces we navigate through as a means to imagine and create a world free of them, end quote. Creation and imagination seem key in expressions of Black joy, examples of which include humor, laughter, art, and dancing. Even during heavy events like a 2020 Black Lives Matter protest in London that included a spontaneous and widespread rendition of the electric slide. Similarly, queer joy exists in tension with ongoing struggles and oppression and frequently embraces creative expression. In one poignant example, we have this 2002 zine, Camp Trans. You can see the little aviator on the cover advertising that the camp has been fighting anti-trans policy since 1992. The specific policy campers were fighting was trans exclusion from the Michigan Women's Music Festival. Amid discrimination, Trans women and their allies found joy and camaraderie in creating a small community in the camp and a zine to go with it. While the zine covered the crisis at hand and made the case for the music festival's policies being unjust, it also included images of happy trans people and a bit of humor about reusing hormone files, which you can see on the slide. If anyone needs a fishing bob, Camp Trans has you covered. Queer joy doesn't have to be tied to specific instances or struggles. In fact, it has many dimensions. The podcast Gay-ish dedicated its June 2022 episode to queer joy. In, in it, the hosts discuss how the phrase has come into prominence in the past few years, mainly since the pandemic, and cover a few possibilities for definitions. One host looked it to Matthew's Place, an online forum, and found a quote from Sassafras Lowry saying that queer joy is like an inner pride parade every day. Here we have an excellent image of an Iowa City pride parade years ago with Sandy Pickup and Jeffrey Palermo as the couple from American, in parentheses, lesbian, gothic. A really close look at the poster on the side of the truck reveals a possible chant, he, he, hey, hey, even farmers can be gay. Classic tongue in cheek Iowa pride float. To go back to our inner pride parade, imagine queer joy as the feeling they had when these women were building this float and riding in it. <laughs> of course, the gayish podcast conversation goes on. The idea comes up that queer pride is not totally the same as queer joy, and queer joy isn't necessarily even the same as pleasure. It should be more existential, long-lasting, fulfilling. A couple of examples of this sort of satisfaction might be found in the lesbians of the Iowa City Women's Press and the journal Common Lives, Lesbian Lives. Founded in the early 1970s, the Iowa City Women's Press was the only lesbian-owned and operated press in the Midwest. The press existed within a surge of feminist printing and bookstores that were open to any women, regardless of sexual orientation, but focused on lesbian publications from journals filled with sincere stories, art, and poetry. Like Common Lives, Lesbian Lives, to the lighthearted lesbian card game, that's G-A-Y-M-E, called Spinster that's played with in-group lesbian stereotypes like Softball Sal, Phoebe Femme, and Betty Butch. The women at the press in the previous slide doesn't look ecstatic, but she does look satisfied. The press gave women a place to do something meaningful for the community on a national level without having to suppress their lesbian identities. Still. The conversation on queer joy goes on. Queer joy can also be sparked by the feeling of acceptance, that you are in a place where you are accepted for who you are. The example offered in the podcast is seeing a pride sign in your neighborhood. But I would go on to say that even in a wider society that isn't accepting of LGBTQ individuals, queer joy exists in the spaces that the community carves out for themselves. For example, 
We have images from Rush of the very unofficial sorority, Delta Psi Kappa, aka Dyke. As an archivist, I don't know too much about Dyke, like when exactly it happened or how long it went on. But what I can infer from the pictures on this slide and the women I know were involved is that it was lesbian affirming. The women in the pictures made a space on, in campus life that offered them the kind of sisterhood that they could not get at the time from Greek life, where they could express themselves freely. And don't they look thrilled? I would extend the theme of acceptance into self-acceptance as well. Tess Catalano was a prominent member of Iowa City's lesbian community in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. You can see Tess here next to the Fat Power Graffiti. She was also a singer-songwriter whose work contained a warm humor that spanned her experiences. As you can, you can see some of that humor in uh, the flyer shown here, Tess, not too many depressing songs along with an inspiring embrace of herself. You can see that here in a draft of her song, My Mustache. Many women in my family have had them. Mine has always been there. When I was young, I tried to hide it, thought I should despise it. It's my mustache. Now I wouldn't think to clip it safe upon my lip. It's my mustache. She continues characterizing women's facial hair as attractive. You haven't really lived till you felt the friendly cilia of a woman's facial hair. Fuzzy, soft, gentle facial hair. It often makes people stop and stare. Some will call Mr., but can't they see? I'm round and fat and oh so womanly. It seems to me the way they gape, it can only show they really must like my mustachio. Imagine if you can, sitting in a space surrounded by women, many of whom are lesbians like you, listening to Tess singing the song about full acceptance of her body from a lesbian point of view, laughing and maybe singing along to the chorus, tell me you don't feel joy. So, queer joy can be characterized by pride and celebration, by fulfillment and satisfaction, and by acceptance of oneself and by society. In all of the examples I've shown so far, and in many more, creativity and imagination play a large role as well. When I think of creativity and imagination in queer culture, I can't be the only one who's thinking drag. If you've been to the Out and About exhibit, you'll have seen panels focusing on drag in Iowa City, including the I C Kings and this outrageous flyer for the Gay Liberation Front's 1974 outrageous weekend, featuring a depiction of the one and only drag legend, Divine. We can see another example of drag here. It's not a drag show like the Icy Kings though. It's a 1975 all woman production of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew. Auditions for the production were advertised in the first issue of the Lesbian Alliance's newsletter with a note that the group was very excited about the possibility of a woman's theater. The Taming of the Shrew centers on the battle of the sexes, and as you can see, the cast members chose to portray the male characters as men. This allowed them to get creative with gender and appearance in a way that they couldn't do in public, collectively imagining a world where they could woo other women on stage and step into some of the juicier male roles in Shakespeare's plays. Their faces and costume belie excitement, confidence, comfort, and of course, queer joy. Where does this kind of joy thrive? I referenced one type of place earlier, ones that are safe and accepting of LGBTQ plus identities. Today, we are lucky that the university has a Pride Alliance Center and the city of Iowa City has a parade and festival to celebrate Pride every summer. 
Using the archives, we can look to the past and see that these spaces for queer joy used to be smaller and less supported by authorities like the city government and the university. They were physical places like Grace and Ruby's, a woman's restaurant, and intellectual ones like the pages of the Lesbian Alliance's humorously titled newsletter, Better Homes and Dykes. Better Homes and Dykes, or BH and D, was founded in the early 1970s right along with the Lesbian Alliance, an Iowa City organization. The newsletter was meant not to replace physical gatherings or small groups, but to support them and give them a friendly space to advertise. Going through the schedules of events listed in BH and D is sort of like being given a map to all the places in Iowa City where it was safe to be out during the 1970s and 80s. The first issue alone lists the Women's Action Theater putting on Taming of the Shrew in the Wesley House basement, a Labor Day picnic, and three women's dances at the Unitarian Church. Later, the newsletter would spread the word about events at Plains Woman Bookstore and the Women's Coffee House, and it would print years of softball schedules for teams competing from Grace and Ruby's and the Women's Resource and Action Center. Take a look here at the archival evidence of some of these places of queer joy. We have a t-shirt for Plains Woman Bookstore, stationery from Grace and Ruby's, a Labor Day picnic flyer that says softball before, softball after, softball always, and a picture of one softball game where the very serious female athletes all had a blast in costume. In BH and D, Lesbian Alliance members spread the word about these spaces and supported a print space for women to express themselves through book reviews, articles, letters to the editor, and poetry without having to disguise their sexuality. One issue included this poem by Paula Klein entitled Softball Rap. Listen, women's arms are flinging softballs through the cool night air, their voices creating a territory our own. Bodies become speech, that angle of an elbow, legs intent upon speed, something spoken in a woman's good right arm, the beauty of the baseman's whirl, the shortstop ignoring twilight, the outfielder's arm stretched toward a descending object, each beautiful and intent, and all of us women. The sun disappears, the ball is white as the moon rising, passing between us like a personal comet instead of words, sometimes instead of kisses, all of us women. We drink, we play softball, there might be a party, who knows, shouting towards cars how this game becomes our personal statement, how this game becomes you. To me, something about it evokes a content summer evening, being content with oneself, a certain kind of queer joy. BH and D had this kind of content, but I also love reading it for its humor. These women didn't shy away from a little good fun. For instance, these letters to the editor, a joke in three parts. The first letter objects to a recent cover. I think it's awful for you to put naked women cavorting around on the cover of your newsletter. Whatever happened to good old-fashioned modesty and decency? Why do you assume that just because we're all out revolutionary write-ons that we want to see unclothed bodies on the cover of our paper? The second letter says, Whatever happened to the pictures of naked women cavorting around on the cover of your newsletter? I miss them. And finally, dear readers, because of a lack of letters from you giving us your opinions and problems, we may soon be forced into making up our own, the editors. I think perhaps they started making things up before this was printed. Don't you agree? Queer joy can also happen in the tiniest spaces with just one or two people. Here we have Kittredge Cherry and Audrey Lockwood, who met as students at the University of Iowa their freshman year. Kit and Audrey created their own little space for queer joy in their relationship with each other. A photo book the two produced in 2016 commemorates their 40 years together and has pictures of joy after joy. Kit and Audrey in a dorm, Kit and Audrey living in Japan, moving to California, posing with their pets, 
having a 1987 wedding at the LGBTQ inclusive Metropolitan Community Church, and later celebrating when marriage equality finally became law in the United States. You could look at this couple's story as one of strife, struggling together against a world that didn't want them to be out. And that would be true. But their happiness is also true. And thankfully, we have the archival evidence. All of this happiness, the newsletters, the drag, the softball games and dances, the lives of one couple have archival value. Because until recently, so many of the queer stories we would see in mainstream culture focus on struggle and unhappiness. They end poorly. As Pilot Viruet wrote in the 2020 TV Guide article, finally, queer joy is infiltrating TV. They said, on TV, I saw teenagers kicked out of their houses, trans characters beaten, and lesbians unceremoniously killed off. Going off nothing but media, I learned that being queer meant having an entire life rooted in secrets, trauma, violence, and self-hatred. While there are some truths found in these narratives, there's also truth in the opposite. Queerness also includes fun, joy, community, crushes, first kisses, and so on. But for a long time, it seemed like television wasn't aware of this, or at least didn't care enough to show it, which is why it's been wonderful and affirming to see happier, funnier, and more casual portrayals of queerness on television lately, end quote. People should see the same kind of balance between happiness and difficulty in the archival records as we are starting to see in popular culture. Like our favorite TV characters, average LGBTQ plus people in Iowa have complex lives, including creativity and joy. And here's a few of them. This is a Halloween dance found in the Carla Miller and Jean Bott papers. Miller and Bott saved dozens of photos of Iowa City's lesbian community in the 1970s and 1980s doing ordinary things. Some people might say they are not a big deal. Others might say, as Randall Jimerson did in his book Archives Power, that they, quote, convey essential meanings about people's lives, hopes, and aspirations, end quote. Or, as I'm about to add, they convey queer joy. According to the hosts of the Gayish podcast, a great way to center queer joy in your own life is learning about queer history. Learning about queer history can be inspiring and assure people that they are not alone. Likewise, we've learned that feeling acceptance from society can spark queer joy. Having queer history available and being included in our social memory through archives and books and art can provide that sense of acceptance and joy. So collecting and preserving queer joy creates more queer joy, which can produce more creative expressions of queer joy to collect in a self-reinforcing cycle that will benefit us all into the future. Now, maybe this sparked queer joy for you. Maybe you saw yourself here or someone like you or maybe you didn't. You might be asking, where are the non-binary people? The trans people? Where's the intersection of race and sexuality? Well, as our exhibit notes, we don't have everything. And we recognize that that is a problem. Although we can preserve only a sliver of a sliver of what humanity produces, I believe we have a duty to try to preserve humanity in its diversity as best we can. We at Lyle, the University Archives, and the Iowa Women's Archives are all working to improve our collections with this in mind. In the meantime, would you like to help us? If you feel you weren't represented or you'd like to contribute to the joyful pride parade of queer history, please consider sharing your story through this exhibit. A link can be, can be provided. And with that, always remember, queer joy has value here. Queer stories belong here, and happy Pride Month.